I know you remember these holes. And what about this over here? And then you've got all of this underneath the windscreen. And hey, let's not forget the sill. That wasn't good at all. Well, guess what? Oh, Smoother than the cream in a Twinkie. Can you believe the finish on this? <laughs> So silky, I just had to bring in some 70s adult cinema. I actually can't believe I achieved a finish as good as this. And Tina is looking a million rubles. And I haven't even polished her yet. Just look at this sill though. I mean, it isn't perfect. There are things I know I could have done better on this. But I never could have hoped to have gotten this finish just trucking along by myself at home outside. I am over the moon because I've got new skills. About a fortnight ago, this smiley fella, Keith, came down, picked her up, and we brought her to the body shop, where the guys instantly started training me in the art of auto body. Gar, Sai, and Dean. This is Sai working on this white car, and we'll keep an eye on this because this car had damage on both sides and front and back, and it came and went long before the 10 days that I was working on Tina elapsed. Any one of these guys could have knocked Tina out in two days or less, and it took me 10. So the first thing I was shown was how to back tape. This is from masking up. And what I've done here is to bring the tape in around the inside of the windscreen surround, but facing outwards, sticky side out. And then you use the paper, you fold it up behind itself and let it tack onto the tape. Now, when the guys did this, it looked like the piece of paper had been cut perfectly for the windscreen. When I did it, well, it's considerably rougher. The second thing was to mask up the surrounding panels to save them from any damage. Now, I should have done this in the first place. I should have known through common sense to have done this, but there you go. So with the sides taped up, I used air tools for the first time, and I used a wire brush and a little sanding disc to take my old filler out and to clean up the repair. And doesn't the markings that the little sander left just make this look way more professional straight away? I was already getting very excited about this whole thing if a little daunted, but I had no idea how much work was to come. We were ready to start preparing. Now, from this point in, this whole deal, all of this auto body, right down to the point where you're painting, is all about feel. Yes, you use your common sense in your eyes, but the fact is, you're not gonna be able to see half of the inconsistencies in a repair like this. You have to feel it, and you have to feel it often. Do a little bit of work, feel it again. Where is the panel? How has it moved? Feel it some more. Sai came along, ran his hand over it and said, this is a little bit too flat in two places. And in a shot, you'll see in a second, you can actually see that. So he got a ball peen hammer and a lump hammer and he started using them to start putting some shape back into my repair panels. And what he's explaining to me here is just that, that there were two sections that just I hadn't formed enough before I let them into the car and they were sitting flat. And he's feeling from where the panel is good back into my repair area so that he can follow a line and add shape in where I had left it out. And he's not hammering hard here. He's just tapping away, letting the metal fall gradually. He used exactly the same technique along the bottom of the windscreen. And all the while as he went, he was testing it for feel to see where the high spots were, where the low spots were and where it fell flat or too curved. And when he got to the near side corner of the scuttle, he said, I bet you this is where you started. And I said, yeah, it is. How did you know? And he said, well, because you were on it here. This is pretty good. But it gave you a false sense of security. And when he went across to the other side to do it, you just thought, oh, you got this sorted and it's not nearly as clean a job. And he was right. And nobody could tell you how to reshape the repair in your car without feeling it themselves. So you're on your own there. But assuming we've gotten our panels to a point where there's a nice shape in them, you're ready to start preparing them to accept filler. And what you've got to do here is feather the paintwork back away from the bare metal so that there's no perceivable, again by feel, no step, no transition that you can feel between bare metal and paint. So what you're doing is 
you're trying to separate however many layers of paint and primer you have so it should run from bare metal into a layer of primer into maybe a second layer of primer into an undercoat into the color and then into the lacquer or top coat if that's how your car is constructed but the point is that you should visibly be able to see you know millimeters to centimeters of each coat of paint that will guarantee that there is a progressive and smooth transition from bare metal into paint and that is going to give you the best chance of feathering the filler when you sand it back into the paint so you can see here the dark gray of the primer a white undercoat in some places a red undercoat and then the top coat of color and we're using a random orbit sander with 80 grit you could use 80 or 180 grit but it's actually quite coarse at this point it's not so important that you are going over this with with very very fine sandpaper it's just to feather the paint back because we're going to do a hell of a lot of sanding so as i started to mix the filler and do i need to reiterate that cliche of the golf ball and the pea it really struck me just how methodical he was how thorough he was about mixing this very very well and he mixed it longer than i thought it would be possible to mix it and still have working time and then as he started to apply it he was very methodical he worked slowly and smoothly and he concentrated on each area until it was right and then moved on by the way another thing that runs all the way through this is that you start from the outside of your repair and work in so he's starting from the paint from over where the paint is thick and he's dragging the filler down over the repair you see he started on the a pillar and he's coming down and he hasn't even come onto the repair too much until he's more happy with what he has on the a pillar and he's loading up the panel and then he can drag the applicator where he wants the filler to go now on the applicator one of my problems was definitely the fact that I was using the applicator that came with the tub of filler that I had bought and it was much smaller than this and way stiffer so it wasn't really on for conforming to the shape of this panel. So get yourself some kind of applicator that has a bit of flex to it. And you can see how slowly and methodically he's working here which was a revelation to me because I realized I had rushed every time that I had mixed up some filler I was just thinking I don't want this to go off so I was working too quickly and the results showed that it showed the mess I was left with at the end was a clear sign that I'd been rushing the other thing is I'll show you it here he explained that you don't need in each swipe you don't need a lot of filler on the applicator you just take a moderate amount just enough to cover one section of your repair now i've left all this in real time so you can see just how much time he had to work this he never stopped but he never rushed and just to reiterate you can see he has gone across to the far side of the repair and worked his way in from there making sure to pull the filler right down over the paint and yet He's still at this point working it and you see on the a pillar there's a thin bit here and he's not rushing to clear it up in my mind I was going Jesus, get that quick get it quick but he's still working calmly and smoothly and I think that is a key thing now another factor here is that high points if you leave anything high on this filler it's not a big deal that will sand down it's the low points that you have to sand down as far as so if you've got a low point or a pock mark and it goes right down to the metal well you might as well have not fill that area because you're going to have to sand everything around it down to that level to meet it and when it came to doing the inside of the windscreen surround I had again tried to do it with the applicator and it was the biggest mess of all and he simply put down the applicator and used his finger and again worked in the filler until he had a nice even layer all the way along 
And this is one of those things that when you see it done, it looks easy and it's common sense. But until you see it done, you kind of flounder. So here again, you see there's a few little bits sticking up. They'll quickly sand back. And Sai does tackle them to an extent. But the fact is, these will sand back very easily before we even touch the rest. So with the offside done, we turned our attention over to the section underneath the windscreen, which had been incredibly difficult because it is a compound curve. It's curved around the front of the car underneath the windscreen, but also north-south. It curves up from the grille up to the bottom of the windscreen. And I had again tried to do this with the applicator, which was just too stiff. But again, Sai just used his finger. It was the most economical way, both time-wise and in terms of the shape here, to get filler exactly where we wanted it. And again, inside the windscreen surround, he just used his finger. And as he extended over towards the near side repair, he went back to the applicator. Just seeing this done so calmly and methodically it was a massive help in itself and I'm hoping you being able to see it will have the same effect that you'll be able to attack a job like this with this kind of methodology and a systematic approach. Oh yeah, that's right George, you point out the bits that you think the expert missed. I just found myself absolutely awed by how patient these guys are with the amount of prep and re-prep and prep again that these guys have to do they have the patience of saints so this is me blue gloves are me and you can see straight away i'm just doing this so much better now he pointed out that i'd left it was slightly thin just right up on the lip and all that was was i had pressed a little bit too hard you only have to rest almost the applicator and the filler onto the panel and then drag it down. You don't have to put a huge amount of pressure on at all. You just have to keep contact. Again, I'm letting this play in real time to give you a sense of how long you have to work with this filler. So I did it even worse that time. Now he stopped me from fixing that up And all he got me to do was overlap on that thin piece to rectify, just to get a bit more filler onto it. And this next bit was tricky because the A-pillar comes down onto the scuttle, which has that compound curve in it, but the A-pillar also has a curve in it running down towards the trim piece. So this is Sai taking over again, and you can see what he's doing is loading up the applicator, depositing the filler up high where he's going to start and then dragging the filler down across the repair. And he's doing it in stages. He's not trying to tackle this whole section of a pillar in one because the applicator simply won't curve around it. And you can see he's speeded up a bit because we've spent a few minutes here with me messing around and he's worried that the filler is going to start going off. And now you can see it has started to clag up a bit. It's starting to go off. So he's working a little bit faster just to get a coverage here and to drag the filler back up onto the paint. Now I felt bad that I'd wasted time here and it meant that we didn't get a full coverage. But as he explained to me, you would never expect for your first skim of filler to be enough. You get your first skim on, it should be pretty good when you're done with it. But 
you can be damn sure you'll be applying filler a second time. So there you go, the first episode with no time lapse in it. But you know, there would have been no learning in seeing this happen without the actual motions that we went through. So I hope this has been a really good help. And with the four corners of the windscreen filled, we have to step back to let this cure. And I think that's a natural step in half point. We've been watching this for 15 minutes, by the way. The last thing I'll say is leave your applicator standing in whatever filler you have left or even flatten it because when that filler goes off, it'll just crack straight off the applicator and you won't have to muck around cleaning it. There you go. The simple prep of a panel and application of some body filler. If you haven't noticed already, this has been a kind of a different episode in terms of format. Well, I'm changing things up and things are changing. Episode 31, we'll see the end of our run with Valet Pro, who have been an incredible sponsor. I can't overstate that. They've been so supportive and enthusiastic. So I'm starting my thanks with this episode. I'm going to try and bring you more episodes, but shorter. So hopefully one a week and we're talking 15 to 20 minutes max. This one may stretch a little bit because we've got this stuff to cover. But that's what I'm gonna try and do to make my life easier and to try and play into how YouTube works in terms of what they want to see you doing. Um, so that's the plan. In terms of the Valley Pro thing, things are gonna get tight again, very tight. So if you were playing with the idea of becoming a supporter of Soup, now would be a great time. And to my new supporters, my new patrons, John Yu and Padio Lalesh, guys, thanks a million. Really good to have you on board, especially now. Um, and thanks to all my patrons who have been sticking with me and are always great fun and supportive behind the scenes on Patreon. Um, there's just enough time to give some shout outs to Wayne Rowley Cher, who sent photos of his Mini that he's obviously doing body work on, so perfect timing, but also his Golf GTI, a Mark I, and he's shoehorning a Mark IV turbo engine into this thing. That's gonna be sprightly to say the least. I hope the project goes well, pal, and you know, you're behind the wheel and join it very soon and keep it up. Long time soup supporter and friend of the series, Colin Hagen, we shouted out his W123 a couple of times before. He's been doing fantastic work on it, did lovely work around the rear arches. But between myself and his other half, Ashley, we thought it'd be nice to give him another shout out because himself and the W123 have been in the wars. It was parked outside awaiting some more attention and it became the stopping point for a high speed police chase. Have a look at this. Can't be nice to have done so much work on the car and then to have somebody crash into it before it's even finished. So Carl, chin up pal. We'll see the car done soon I'm sure. And uh, don't let it phase you. This is an odd one because I wanna send a second kit to our kit recipient from last episode, Aaron Judd. Now the thing is, Aaron technically wasn't getting the kit last episode, it was for his friend and mentor Ray who had also owned his Celica Supra before him but helped him through the restoration. In the meantime Aaron took it upon himself to set up a GoFundMe campaign to try and get Soup a decent welder and I was blown away and I wanted to do something for him just by way of thanks because it really put a pep in my step. Not least because he's managed to get some people to pledge too. So, you know, it's kind of well on its way. We're kind of a tenth of the way there, which I really didn't expect. Um, I will link it in the description, but really I just wanted to say thank you to Aaron because while I was working on Tina at Delta, I used their proper welder. And yeah, as you've been all telling me, it's a whole different kettle of fish. So I would love one. I've, I've actually been struggling on way too long with what I have. So that would be fantastic. But look, that may be another way for you if you just wanted to kind of do a one-time little bit of support. Right, there is time for one last interesting thing. While Tina was being loaded onto the flatbed, I noticed that driver Keith did something really kind of funky. He had his straps tailed just short enough or long enough that they'd accommodate anything that he could fit on the truck. But there's not a whole load of spare kind of strap flapping around that you have to tie down. And what he does is he feeds the tail of it into the ratchet as he's tightening it up, which tightens it faster, 
you can tell me whether you think it has the same grip or not but then he can loop what's left in under the handle and lock it down and it's extremely neat i just thought it was very cool you take that with a pinch of salt do what you want with it i just thought i'd show it to you okay i'll be along really soon hopefully with episode 31 until then don't give up and good luck